It's self-funding, it's self-sustaining, it grows as we grow. It's unbelievably capital efficient. It's like, why don't we just drive earnings and drive reinvestment in a disciplined way to build that flywheel over time? And that's what's happening. And so the 5149, a 10 year commitment, we've got 95 equity partners who've made that commitment and 9% of the revenue being consistently reinvested in that structure. It is entirely unique in the entire world and it is extraordinarily powerful over time. So for those in the audience who don't yet know Brett, he's the founder and CEO of Kelly Partners Group. He started the business back in 2006, and it's been quite a successful company over the years. And uh, Brett seems to have a really interesting background that I wanted to learn more about alongside the audience. And I'll note that from 2007 through 2023, Kelly Partners has had a revenue growth rate of 31% per year. And he also created significant amounts of shareholder value over that time period. And we're going to be getting to Kelly Partners. But I wanted to start by talking about Brett first. And uh, I'll also mention just a full disclaimer that I do not own shares in Kelly Partners Group, at least at the time of this recording. And uh, yeah, just wanted to make that fully known to the audience before we dive in here and uh, dive into Brett's background and dive into KPG. Before we talk about Kelly Partners specifically, uh, when I discovered your work and dug into your background, I found that you have a very similar passion and interest to me and many of the people here at TIP and many in our audience. And that's studying what successful people have done and figuring out how you can take those lessons and implement them into your own life. So talk more about that journey and how that started for you and how that led you to starting Kelly Partners. So Clay, it's a really great observation. I was with a mentor of mine yesterday who now is 64, worth about $4 billion. And he just said the things that so many people have said to me over the years. And that is that from a $25 book, you can learn hundreds of years of wisdom and certainly decades of business experience. And that if you're just humble enough to take the lessons of the greats and apply them without ego and without revision, then so often they will move you forward. Now, they may not be the answer in full to every question because things change and we need to stay front-footed and dynamic, but they get you, you know, 80% down the track in almost all situations. And so as a very young person, I was lucky in a sense that, um, you know, I was the kid that came first in everything. I have seven brothers, middle of eight boys. So you grow up pretty, you know, self-reliant because otherwise you starve. And then, you know, I, I, my father had a business. Um, he was recommended an accountant by his auditors. That accountant turned out to be a gambler who embezzled money. It damaged the business. I saw the impact on my father of that. Instead of going and studying law, I decided to study accounting because it's the language of business. And I went into um, Pricewaterhouse as an undergrad when I really could have done anything. Um, but I thank God I did that because I got to see at a very young age, fantastic businesses up close and personal. I did four and a half years there. I went to an investment bank and I lost my job. I was told that I didn't fit in with other people, which was true. I had worked with um, a, a senior director and a senior manager, and I never forget him commenting on a on a multi-billionaire client that he was just a greengrocer. And that greengrocer was one of Australia's most successful business people ever. And I remember that comment hitting me so clearly that I... You know, I was there in this investment bank wanting to learn from the clients and yet the self-centered arrogance of the person I was working with, not the senior directors, but the people I had to work in with was horrible and I just didn't, didn't share their values. And so when I lost my job and that comment was made, I thought it was really true. <laughs> I was lucky. I was given out placement services at a group called Morgan and Banks, a very successful um, human resources group. And there was a clinical psychologist and she met with me and said, Brett, you know, how do you feel about this? And I said, well, I don't, you know, I think it's true. I don't think I fit in with that type of person. Um, and so now I'm not really sure what I want to do, but I do feel great relief that now I've done everything everyone told me to do. I've done the degrees and got the jobs and whatever, but my, my values aren't money, status, and power. And so 
I don't feel like I know what I'm meant to do. I went home. My dad was my greatest supporter. He's dead now, but a wonderful guy. He'd come to Australia. You know, he'd been left school at 13, worked as a, as a helper in a five-star hotel where he said, you know, he was trained to set tables and iron linen. And, and he said, you know, but what I was taught, Brett, was that, you know, you need to be able to deal equally well with kings and paupers and everyone in between and treat them well. And so he then went into the British Navy, ended up in Australia with, you know, five pound pomp and he, you know, built his business and he was just great with people. He was always an encouraging person, but he gave me two books. One was called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie and the other one was called Think and Grow Rich. And, you know, in the, all of the academic study I'd done, there was not a single class on working with people. And this book turned up, talked about how important it is to be very good with people. Now I'd captained every sporting team and debating teams and all sorts of things. But the emphasis on working well with people and, and putting yourself in other people's shoes and genuinely focusing on how to make other people better off and knowing that the more people you helped achieve their goals made it much more likely that you would achieve yours was a huge paradigm shift from a, you know, a, a, a self-centered to another person-centered dynamic, which, which I, I look genuinely by nature, I believe I had, and that's why I didn't feel I fitted in, in these other situations. But the other book, um, Think and Grow Rich was great because it talked about find people that have been successful and ask them what it was that made them successful. Now I had no idea at this point what I wanted to do. I was very disenchanted with what I'd seen commercially and I hadn't found what I came later to, to think of as a mission based organization, something bigger than the, the sort of egos of the people involved. And, and so I loved the book and I was like, okay. I went back to this outplacement service. I got this little book called The Who's Who of Australia. It was a little red book. And I just wrote a list of 80 prominent Australians I'd love to meet if I could meet anyone. And they were from the politicians to the religious leaders to um, academics to um, sporting heroes, um, billionaires, the whole lot. And I basically made this list of 80 people I'd love to meet. And I thought if I could meet them, I could ask them, well, what is it really like to be the prime minister? What is it really like to be a business titan? What is it really like to be the leader of a major religion? What is it really like to be in, in academia or to be a sporting hero? I, I was a kid. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I wrote this letter. Uh, Dear Mr. Hawke, former Australian prime minister, my name's Brett Kelly. I'm 22. I'm unemployed, but I'm keen to learn. If you're prepared to spend one hour answering my 11 standard questions, I would be very pleased to interview you face to face, collate a book and put that book to out to other young Australians who are keen to learn. And surprisingly, if you make 5,000 phone calls over three months, um, and you learn how to make phone calls, um, I got 34 of those 80 prominent Australians to meet with me in a 12 week period, turn that into 800,000 words, um, in four lever arch files. I had initially gone to three major publishers. They said, you won't get the people. I then went back to them and said, look, I've got the stuff. What do I do now? And they said, well, you're not um, Ray Martin or Philip Adams, which is, say, Larry King or, or Howard Stern. So who, who's going to read your book? There are 800 new books released every week, and most of them lose money. So how's your book going to stand out? And I said, well, if you're 22, you're unemployed, and you write a book, instead of feeling sorry for yourself, maybe there's an audience that are interested in that. And that became this book and it's a, it's a beast. It's, it's really something quite special that I realize now I'm 49 at 22. It was just, you know, what you do when you're desperate to learn and don't know what to do with your life. And so that's what happened. I made the phone calls. I basically persistently put myself in a position to find these people to talk to me. I would track them down to art gallery openings or things that they were speaking to. I'd stand outside and try and get them to talk to me and basically corral everyone into the book. When I couldn't get a major publisher to take the book on, I found Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield, and they are two American lads who had written the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, and they'd sold 500 million books, and they had made a 24 cassette tape series on how to publish a best-selling book with a workbook. 
And so I bought that from the US. It cost me $1,200 in $1997, so a huge amount of money. I had bought at this time the Simon & Schuster self-help tape catalog, every tape that they'd published, about 2,000 tapes. I bought a bookshelf and put them all in there. And while I was sitting in my garage, my phone line that I'd put in making these calls, I would just listen to these tapes. And I attribute that as, as really changing my mindset and broadening and deepening my understanding of sort of life and, and people. Um, I later learned through the Gallup um, strengths test that my number one strength is learning. And, you know, I didn't realize that that was really what gave me energy. And so that was that exercise. I was very lucky that I had read Philip Fisher's book, first book I read on the stock market of common stocks and common profits. At Pricewaterhouse, I had joined the EVA group and I'd read uh, this book, um, Creating Shareholder Value, which is still on my desk this morning by Alfred Rappaport. It's a book few people have read, but it's a wonderful book. And that had led me to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And so I'd been reading all of their newsletters. I'd send them to you if you asked in these dodgy old binded editions. And, you know, I was working in this investment bank at the time I lost my job. I'd, re- I'd read The Warren Buffett Way, which is a wonderful book by Robert Hagstrom. And I realized that in Australia, nobody knew who Warren Buffett was. I'll never forget being in this investment bank and one of my colleagues saw the book in my bag and they said, why do you read books like that about people who, you know, are talking about how to make money when they're just trying to sell books to make money? And I said, do you know who Warren Buffett is? And this person said to me, no, I don't know who Warren Buffett is. And that was another situation in this investment bank where I thought I'm in the wrong place. Like if you don't know who Warren Buffett is and and you're in investment banking, I'm just in the wrong place. I came to learn later, Clay, that in professional services, our industry, the one thing you can't find is professional service. And in investment banking, the one thing you can't find is a banker that invests uh, because they're so transactional. Um, And so that's what happened. So I'm young. I go back into chartered accounting. So I, I, you know, I, I do the books, a few hundred professional speaking engagements where they paid me. I realized that was personal exertion. I went back into chartered accounting, finished my CA program, did my master's, got my tax agent, went through three firms, hoping to become an equity partner. At first, I thought that the partners in these firms were just duplicitous and hopeless, but I came to learn later that they were in fact the operators of small businesses. And as operators of small businesses trying to look after the business, look after the clients and live, they were too busy. And so as a young guy, when you said, hey boss, how do I become a partner? They didn't have a system. They didn't have a letter. They didn't have time to run the business. And so three times in a row, I'd been told, well, yeah, we'll make you a partner if you do this. I did that. They then said, oh, sorry, we got that wrong. We need to wait a bit longer or something. And eventually a friend of mine in March, 2006, Scott Elwin said, Hey Brad, I'm in this bad partnership. Can you help me get out? You have 75%. I'll have 25. You run the business. I'll run the clients. Now I'd worked with Scott for three years, about four years before that. And I guess what I'd love your audience to understand is that often who you are is more obvious to other people as a young person than it is to you. And so my mate, my very good mate saw in me that I really understood business, that I had a huge passion for it, that as a combination, we'd be, we'd be much better off than we would as individuals. And he encouraged me to help him set a firm up for him. You know, I really understood that because I'd self-published this book, made it a number one bestseller. I sort of understood a lot of things accountants don't understand. So I raised the money to, to, you know, I got the people in the book. I put the team together to publish the book. I raised the money to print the book. I sold the books. I did all the PR. I did all the professional speaking and I had to learn how to sell a product. And then I went back into accounting where no one really knows any of that because they don't have that experience. And so that's sort of in March, 2006, I started Scott Elwin and co with Scott. And then three months later, my boss had promised one thing and, you know, promised the world and delivered an atlas. And so two of my colleagues said, couldn't you start a firm for us like you've started for Scott? 
and I was pretty annoyed at this point to be gentle. And, um, I said to my wife, you know, this industry is hopeless. These people are just dishonest. I don't want a bar of it. And she's like, yeah, but Brett, my wife, Rebecca, um, is an accountant and said, but Brett, you know, we've got a nine month old child at this point. You're so good at it. Why don't you just build a firm for them? And I'm like, oh, so I consider myself like the reluctant co-founder with Beck. We didn't have many options. My boss had said, well, Brett, if you don't like this offer, you can always go across the street and, you know, see how you go, but you'll need the cash flow. Now, I'm not the sort of person you say that type of thing to. Um, so I did, I went across the street and, um, I came up with this idea of fixed fees for clients where they paid you 50% up front. So that fixed the cash flow. We invested $50,000. I had 200,000 of billings. And we built that, our run rate revenue is about 120 million. I've always considered myself an investor first. I've compounded my own capital at 60% a year for 18 years in a row. And I've done that because I've read everything that Warren Buffett ever wrote. I've read everything that Charlie Munger ever wrote. I followed that seam of wisdom from Ben Graham, or really Philip Fisher to Ben Graham to Charlie Munger to, to Warren Buffett, all the way through to anyone that I can meet that knows anything about anything. If you teach me anything, it goes into my mind and into my notes and your contact details will go into my phone and I'll do everything I can to try and execute on the wisdom that people share with me. So it isn't an accident that the four books I've written from the first one, are a series of books based on wisdom, which is deep understanding. Because I came to learn as I got older that that's the thing that really gives me energy and that really, you know, drives me forward. Yeah, thank you for that very inspiring story. Uh, one thing that stuck out to me there was your skills are a lot more obvious to other people than they are to you. And I wonder if that's what holds uh, some people back, that sort of imposter syndrome or that, uh, that blindness to what it is we're actually good at ourselves or what makes us stand out from the crowd. Yeah, I think in recruiting, you know, in terms of some practical help for people listening, I always ask people who come for an interview as an accountant, oh, do you do bookkeeping for anyone? And they go, oh yeah, I do my mom, my dad, the barber down the road, et cetera, during university or, or college. Often when I say to them, oh, so you have 12 clients, bookkeeping clients. Oh yeah, yeah, I do that in my spare time. People are seeing in that person that they're a really good bookkeeper and they ask them. You know, we had a team member who wrote a lot on stocks and he said, Brett, you know, give me a pay rise. I said, I'm not giving you a pay rise. He goes, well, then I'll leave. I say, I hope you do and spend more time writing on stocks because your great passion is writing on stocks and investing. It's not accounting. And so seeing the thing that you naturally gravitate to when, you know, when you're not being paid in your spare time, if you try to find me on a Saturday, I don't work on Sundays, but I do read on Sundays. I don't consider that work. Um, I will have a book in my head. I will be doing our business. I would rather talk to somebody about their accounting firm or their career or what they're doing in our business or how they can join our group than I would play golf or do anything else. And so once you know yourself better, you know, you're in a much better position and you can find that by asking other people, Hey, what do you see me as being good at? You know, if, if, if you had to give me a million dollars to do something, what would that thing be? Oh, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to give me a million to do one thing. What if, what if you say, and, and that, you know, that's, I think a big part of the process of sort of growing up. During our previous call one-on-one -on -one privately, you spoke very highly of one person in particular, and that was Bernard Arnault. Uh, we beat the drum constantly on the show on uh, Munger, Buffett, and a lot of the other investing greats, but uh, Bernard is probably uh, you know, much less uh, undiscovered relatives as some of these other uh, multi-billionaires. He's actually one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest person, person in the world. I believe his net worth is around $230 billion at the time of recording. And he's the CEO of LVMH, which has a market cap north of $450 billion, just to 
massive, massive company. Uh, I was curious if you could share the story of how you managed to meet him and why you admire him so much. Yeah, so Clay, I have some heroes and often people will, will say, they'll hear me speak about Buffett, you know, in reverential terms, but not really here because they don't know these other people. My great heroes are Bernard Arnault and David Ogilvy, followed by Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and Mark Leonard of Constellation Software. And all for different reasons. I, while I consider myself an investor CEO, the people that I, I most admire are Arno and Ogilvy because they built and operated operating businesses, but with a, an investor's mindset and with a big vision of what was possible. And they prosecuted that vision relentlessly over multiple decades. Um, and I think they, they reshaped or reimagined and then reshaped the industries within which they operate. And so when David Ogilvy built Ogilvy, nobody thought you could build a global advertising agency. And when Arno built LVMH, nobody thought that you could build a global luxury conglomerate. Um, now, similarly, as Warren Buffett built Berkshire with a unique structure and mindset and outlook and methodology, nobody thought you could do that. And every five years he gets bagged and he's done it relentlessly for 50 plus years. So him and Charlie are obviously huge heroes. And similarly with Mark Leonard, so, you know, Will Thorndike's great book, The Outsiders, talks about how different these outsider CEOs are, idiosyncratic. And um, similarly, when Mark Leonard starts buying these little software companies, everyone thinks he's crazy. And most people do. They think you're crazy and, you know, until you're Elon Musk type of thing, then they still think you're crazy. But, um, but all these people like Musk, for example, I'm going to make electric cars. That's crazy. And off he goes. I'm going to build rockets. And, you know, it's crazy until it isn't. But Bernard, I know, holds a special place in my heart. I think the luxury businesses are the greatest businesses in the world, meaning that they're likely to, to last hundreds of years. The demand for, um, you know, the desirability of, of handmade, high quality things that are special that will last generations, I think speaks to something in people's DNA. Those things do not need to be expensive. You know, I'm surrounded by little things like a, a handmade, you know, um, coffee cup from Italy that I just love and it would have cost nothing much, but it's so special because it speaks to a time and a place and a, and a memory. And so I really wanted to meet Bernard. I'd read so much about him. I had read everything that, that exists in English and I'd had things translated from the French to, to be able to read. I think he's, you know, most people really only know their own market. If you're American, you don't look outside America, Australia, you don't look at I've always had this global perspective for some reason. I think it's because my dad had traveled so much and, and was a migrant from England. And, and so I just always had a, a view that the world was bigger than the suburb I lived in. So I find Bernard, I know many years back now, and I just, um, through my books, you know, for example, I wrote to Warren Buffett in 2006. I sent him Robert Hagstrom's book. I said, I'd, you know, I'd read it, changed my life. He wrote back to me and signed my book and sent it back in the reply paid envelope. And so I, I always feel like if you can get near somebody, you get to feel their energy and you get a sense that they're people as well. Now that doesn't mean that they're, they're just people like you and I, because I don't think that's true, but they are people and, and they have built themselves from the inside out, um, to become the full, fullest version of themselves over a lifetime. And I just have a tremendous respect for that, not just in business through my first book, just in life. You know, if you will make the effort to build yourself inside out into the best you can be for others, for the benefit of other people, um, then I think that's the full, um, imagining of the human experience. And, and so to me, that's really profound. So I read everything I can and then I'm like, I've really got to meet this guy. How am I going to do that? So. I found the local um, Christian Dior store and anyone that knows um, anything about Bernard Arnault knows that his favorite business is Christian Dior. That's his great love of, 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 you know, of all of his businesses. And so having discovered that, I read everything I could find on Christian Dior. I have every original book that Christian Dior himself published 
And when I read, I read with a pen and a, and a ruler and I underline, highlight, color and, and mark up a book. It's a, it's a studying effort, not a reading effort. And, um, so I do this. So I find the general manager of Christian Dura in Sydney. I go and meet him, tell him I have to meet him. Um, you can tell from my first book at 22, I, I've got a habit of finding people and, um, you know, I meet him and just with, I'm an enthusiast. So with my enthusiasm, I say, Hey, this is the greatest business in the world. Like, you know, he's Christian starts this and then he does this and he does new look and he does that and he does this and he does that. And it's amazing. You know, how do I get to meet Mr. Arnaud? And he's like, well, Brett, that's not that easy. I said, yeah, I know life's hard, but how can we make that happen? And he goes, well, I've never met anyone that knows more about this business than you. I said, well, that's a great compliment. He goes, how do you know all this? And he starts asking me questions. I said, because I just think this is an incredible business. I think the story is incredible, you know, and so I've studied it. So he thought that was amusing. I actually took my books with me and um, in my roller bag, my Kelly partner's roller bag, I pulled out all these books and I was showing you. And he said, you know, okay, I think I can organize that. So I went downstairs. I took my wife back a week later. I spent a lot of money on on some dresses um, for her. And I love beautiful dresses for my wife. And then this gentleman said, look, Brad, I'm, you know, I'd love to send you to Paris for the Couture show, which is the only show that Mr. I know definitely attends each year. And, you know, we'll put you and back up and the kids and, and you can go to the show. And it was one of the great life experiences. I got to go to the show. I was introduced to Mr. I know I got to meet him for a minute and a half, two minutes. Got enough to get near him and speak to him. Um, might have been longer than that. Felt like an hour. But what was so great was I got to sense, you know, he's very tall, very lean guy, very imperious demeanor. Um, you could feel the sort of intellect and strength of character from 20 yards. It was a great life experience. And so you know, you walk away. My wife is like, Brett, you cannot ask him for a selfie. I have very few re regrets in life, Clay, but that's one of them. She's like, don't you dare ask him for a selfie. And I was like, okay, so, so well behaved, which I regret. Um, but look, it was a great life experience. I'm often asked, you know, if I've tried to meet Warren and I've said no, because I feel like he's taught me so much that in the, in the moments that he has left to live, there's no way that I could possibly justify to myself that asking him to spend five minutes with me is the best investment of the time that he's got left. Um, but in Mr. Arno's case, I hope he lives a lot longer and, you know, it's an extraordinarily special experience. And so that's, you know, if, I guess part of my nature is that when people ask us about the business, I say, well, you know, if you ask me about our marketing, I think. Apple's the best marketing organization in the world with Hermes. And so I mark our marketing efforts versus theirs. So we're currently about 1.5 out of 10. Um, and so I heard the other day on the Founders podcast, um, an episode on David Ogilvy again, which I love, where David Sender said, you know, divine discontent is the antidote to smugness. And so I was born with that discontent, which is helpful. And then we try to communicate that you know, if you're aiming for the stars and pull short, you probably land on the moon. Well, I first really uh, started learning about a lot about you and your company when a member of our mastermind community uh, did a presentation on the company because he held it in his fun and uh, was uh, kind enough to share uh, with the overall group. And I, I just loved one of the comments he made in that presentation. And uh, I thought it was really interesting. He, he called you the dot connector. I don't know if he, he came up with that phrase or if he pulled it from somewhere else, but, uh, you know, it ties into that, that first question we brought today where, you know, you look at, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, for example, using a hold co model and, uh, using decentralization and focusing on capital allocation. And you look at LVMH and centralizing certain aspects of the business, but, uh, leaving, uh, some of the roots to, uh, the individual businesses and then Constellation Software, the, these programmatic acquisitions, and then you can also tie in Walmart and uh, McDonald's. But uh, So that is the game play. Like that's, you know, Charlie Munger has this phrase, and I think it's the name of, of 
or a title of one of the books that investing is the last um, liberal art. And so the ability to, to take ideas from different places and understand how they fit together. Michael Porter at Harvard says that the only way to create competitive advantage today is through the unique combination of ideas and activities. So the ideas, the activities that flow from those ideas. And so the ability to think through, you know, Kelly Partners Group Holdings is a hold co. If people look at the font, it's the font in the logo of Berkshire. But if they look at the typesetting of it, it's got KP with a plus in the middle and GH, which is a nod to LVMH, um, which is, means it's a secondary brand, not a primary brand, because Kelly Partners Accountants is the primary brand to the market. But KPGH is a primary brand to investors um, and, and for people to, to sort of see that. If they think about the way that we've thought about decentralization and capital allocation, that's straight from Graham, Buffett, Munger. The operating investment thesis is Alfred Rappaport, buy assets um, where you can earn a return above the weighted average cost of capital. The way we think about the valuation of the group comes from Hagstrom, two-stage dividend discount model. Um, the way that we think about programmatic acquisition comes from the research of McKinsey than the behavior of, um, of Arnaud and of Mark Leonard. Arnaud buys clapped out 100-year-old brands and from the inside out re-energizes and reimagines the, the, the depth and breadth of, of those organizations. And then David Ogilvy had this vision of a services organization, an advertising agency as a services organization. And what had tipped me off to him was Warren Buffett, who'd invested in Young and Rubicum 30 years ago, but he'd also invested in H&R Block, the accounting group. So if you take that, that web of ideas, you know, I don't expect that any of your listeners are going to hear anything from me today that's particularly unique. I've got the odd turn of phrase, the odd saying that that is unique. But you know what I've learned? I've learned from uh, other people. I have a book behind me, Michael Hill Jewelers, Toughen Up. He he wrote a book that I read in 2009. We listed in 2017. It said, make sure when you list, you hold a controlling interest in the group. So wherever I can learn from, I, I heard the same thing from John Malone, right? Um, I'm just trying to build out a lattice work of ideas and then, you know, relentlessly execute. So in light of uh, learning all these, uh, learning from all these wonderful people, talk to us about uh, the Kelly Partners Group business model uh, for those that aren't familiar in the audience. Yeah, so what I'd learned, Clay, is that when Bill Gates and Warren Buffett were asked together, what is the thing that makes the most difference in business? They answered in unison focus. I'd read a, a, a very old 18th, 1800s sermon to, that was diamonds under your feet. And what that sermon said is that so often people are looking, you know, to somewhere else to, to make a difference, but where they are standing is where they are meant to make a difference. And so I'm in the, the, the tax and accounting industry. They are incredible businesses, Buffett, death and taxes, life's great certainties. You can look out 20 years and you know that you're going to be asked to pay more tax than you were last year because the political class don't want to go to work and they want your money. So I felt that it met the Buffett criteria as a business that wasn't going to disappear. It, it met a personal criteria that I felt that accountants, given what had happened to my dad, could make a huge difference if they wanted to where they were. And then I looked at the businesses themselves. I, I knew the McDonald's business very well. And I said, these businesses are great businesses, but they're poorly operated. My friend Scott had said, Brett, you're great at business. I'm great at being an accountant. Couldn't you help me run the business and I'll do the accounting? And so as you put all those ideas together, I said, right, why don't we build the world's best accounting firm for private business owners, two, two to 10 million? Um, I'll do, you know, I then go to the best people. So got to have the best people proposition. Got to be like Disney, that people want to put on strange outfits and go and volunteer there and work for free to help people find the toilets. And so it's got to have a great people offer. It's got to have great systems and processes so that all the things we promised to do as accounts, we can actually do. Whereas I'd worked in firms where that just wasn't true. And so I thought of McDonald's in terms of systems and processes, in terms of front end with clients, back end, I thought of Walmart. Okay. So Walmart had this strategy, go everywhere. No one wants to be, perfect your operations and you then get large before anyone notices. Then I do have this saying that most people can't see anything because their head's up their own backside. 
And so our industry certainly meets that criteria, very self-important, very inward looking, not looking out at, at the world, not looking at other industries, not looking at other businesses, certainly not looking at the client. And so I then went to the client line. So if you've got your people, your processes right, you've got the right to ask somebody to be a client. And so I said, great, we need to build a system for the clients that can help get them certain about where they are and, and a clear plan to where they want to be, a 10-year plan. You know, what are you working for? You're working for your family and your goals. How are we going to help you progress? So we built a client service system that is completely unique and different to anything else that exists in the world. And then from a financial perspective, I said, well, what would happen if we just ran the numbers as if Warren Buffett was running the show? It, it's not how big your organization is, which our industry is very male, which means it's very phallic, which means it's very focused on size. So it's like my firm's bigger than yours. Well, that's very interesting, but does it actually make its people better off? Does it make its clients better off? Does it make a contribution to the community? Is it establishing a mission-based flywheel? Does it have a model that can refuel so that you can grow something that actually makes a different over, difference over time? Because if we're going to do something, back to Jim Collins, Built to Last, I'd read, I'd read 3,000 books, Clay, so Built to Last, I want to build a 100-year organization, not a 10-minute financial transaction. How are we going to do that? And so that's where we started. I started with Scott, then I did North Sydney, then we had two. We called them Kelly Partners, and I said, I'm going to systemize. And I'm going to write a, I'm going to build a business system. Now, if investors make one, you know, misunderstanding about our group, our holding company owns a business system that can double the profits of an accounting firm, reduce the working capital required to operate that business by two thirds and hand 25 to 40% of the time of the partners back to them. If you can make that much operating difference to a business, then it is likely that many people will want to get into business with you. Now, I've been saying that for years. I don't, you know, from time to time, because I can speak English, people say, well, Brett's a promoter. I don't care if you buy my stock, okay? Um, you will over time. Um, but as for me, I made the decision that you couldn't be differentiated without being different. Now, most people want to be dif differentiated, but they don't want to be different. In our industry, I took the view that the reason that accounting firms are private is because they couldn't behave in public the way they behave in private. And so if I took a 25-year view of the future, we needed to do what Buffett has done, which is be public and show our performance publicly. And so in 2017, we listed the company on the Australian Stock Exchange as a 45 million market cap, you know, two and a half, three million NPAT business. And everyone said to me, but you're too small. Why are you listing at this point? And I said, well, if you're a fund manager in your garage and you do 25% a year returns for three years or five years, and you go to people and say, hey, I'm doing good returns, people will say, well, it's not audited. You're doing it in your garage. How do I know it's real? And what I was finding was when I met senior practitioners, 60, 65, 70, that owned great firms, they said to me, Brett, even if what you say is true, how do I know it's true? You know, you got these private accounts and I'd show them the accounts and the bank accounts and they still wouldn't believe you. So I said, from a credibility point of view, we'll be a public company and we'll deliver returns in public and we will show people, not tell them. Now I'm competent at explaining our business, but I believe that our results would, you know, on, on five year periods, clearly communicate the quality of the business model and our ability to execute that model over time. And that, you know, that is proving to be the case sort of one step at a time. Um, and so that's, that's the business, you know, we find really excellent chartered accounting groups and they've got basically three options. So CPA firms, chartered firms, they can sell internally, but the young guys typically don't have the capital to buy out the older, older practitioner. They can sell increasingly in the U S to private equity. You're basically taking your people and selling them to people that only want to own those people so they can sell those people. And that makes no sense to a founder that has poured his life, his heart, and his soul into building a business. When I meet these founders, I say, what do you want to do? Do you want to be able to look your people in the face? Do you want to look your clients in the face? And do you want to look your community in the face and say, I've sold the business and I don't really care what happens? Or... Do you want to partner with us on a 5149 partner owner driver basis? We'll manage the succession. We'll improve your business. And for the next 50 years, your family can point at that business and say, that was the business that my father built. 
that is the business that I built. And this is the difference that that business is still making in that local community. Now that's been very successful in Australia. I moved to the U S and based myself in Los Angeles with my family in January of 2023. So we've been there nearly a year and a half. We've bought two firms now in Los Angeles, and I think that it is likely that our model will be um, well-received in the US. We're trying to build Australia's global accounting firm because Australia doesn't have a global accounting firm. We basically got down here in Australia sort of the, the, the leftovers of the rest of the world. We're the 13th largest economy in the world. When Australians want to grow globally, there's an accounting group to help them. And I think we can build a spine through LA to London, which is where the big you know, Australian expat communities are London, LA, New York, build that spine and put some muscles on that over time. So that's, that's the play. That's what we're on about. And, um, you know, I think to a, um, to an investor that has a, has a look at what we're doing, they can probably understand the business fundamentals make sense. What really stands out to me there is the 51 49 model. So Kelly partners, purchases 51% of the business and the current owners uh, continue to own 49%. And I think back to uh, the dot connecting uh, constellation software, they uh, do these programmatic acquisitions and they uh, implement these earnouts to help align the incentives. And Berkshire is, you know, a lot of times buying a lot, all of the company in these private transactions and tends to hold it uh, forever. So talk more about how you landed on the 51 49 model. Yeah. So, See if you can follow the bouncing ball here, um, Clay. This is pretty funny. So Warren Buffett in his owner's manual talks about a corporate form, but a partnership mentality. Kelly Partners is in the business of partnership. A 50.01 or 5149 is a partnership, meaning that every time we make a dollar, we get 50 cents each. Every time we lose a dollar, we lose 50 cents each. Every time we do something intelligent together, we both benefit. Every time we do something stupid together, we both experience the cost. And so our business is the business of building and operating partnerships. We think about our external shareholders in the same way and have been at pains to demonstrate that we are a business of partnerships, notwithstanding our corporate form. Where I got the idea from was that it's a 51-49, 10-year starting commitment from a partner. And so when you run the numbers in an accounting firm, if we can double your profits, then you will continue to have a hundred percent of the profits that you always had. And if we can reduce your working capital by two thirds, you'll actually have more cash flow each month than you've ever had. And if we can give you a 35 person specialist management team to get under your firm and take away every nine parts of the business and leave you with just the people, the clients and the community leadership. We'll give you 25 to 40% of your time back. Now, most people, if you give them a deal where they get more time and more money, and we increase the saleability in terms of the succession profile of the equity of the business, and we improve um, their own self-respect in terms of the way the business operates, because the business operates like a first-class, world-class organization, rather than a sort of stuck-together hobby, there is no downside to this um, structure for what we call our operating partners. Interestingly, we need to have a control position from an ability to, to consolidate earnings, but the way the actual operations of the business works, it takes a 75% vote to do much. Um, we can only carry a, you know, with our 50, 50.1 or 51% basic, like we get to choose the bank, the auditor, and some real fundamentals, run the IT, et cetera. Um, and so it is in all senses, a genuine partnership because we believe that people together can do more than individuals. And that was straight from Carnegie, lose your job, got to work better with people. Why don't we just partner together and build something together where we both genuinely benefit. And if I make you better off, you'll make me better off and, and vice versa. So it's really from that philosophy of if you make people better off, then you'll be better off. And we define better off as healthy, wealthy, and wise. The other thing that I'd learned with this sort of 10 year commitment, the book, to, before I go to that, the 5149 is important because most accounting firms, there's five partners, they own 20% each, and they spend their whole life politicking about who's going to do what. If we have a 51% position, that never happens because we simply say to the partners, you need to make a decision, make a decision. 
Now, they know that if they don't make a decision, we can make a decision, but I'm pleased to say in nearly 18 years of running these partnerships, I've never had to sort of use, I have never once had to use my 51% position in any single event ever because the partners in the situation where they know somebody can make a decision and leadership is making decisions. Our industry doesn't move forward because everything's put off to next month, next quarter, next year. Whereas in our partnerships, people are making decisions and that's okay. If you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. You can make a new decision to fix it. (laughs) But the worst decision is no decision and no decision is a decision. So that changes the leadership profile of the firm dramatically. The second thing we worked out was in partnerships, some people were thinking, I'm going to leave next month, but nobody knew. I'm going to leave next year. What I learned from Buffett was that you need a really long-term commitment between your partners because otherwise everyone's got a different time agenda and that destroys your investment proposition. So we asked the partners to make a minimum 10-year commitment. There's huge penalties if they leave before that time. Um, So there's massive disincentives. But most importantly, we know that we can make people very successful over 10 years, but we're certain we can't make them successful over 10 minutes. So that's 10,000 hours, 10 years, et cetera. How I came up with 10 years is the average Australian marriage lasts seven years and the average Australian home mortgage lasts eight years. However, the research indicates that if you stay in your marriage for more than seven years, on average your marriage will last 25 years. I was confident that if people were in business with us for 10 years, they would start to experience compounding. When I do a compound calculation, you don't get much compounding before year 10. But from year 11 to 20, you'll see significant compounding. Now that's true in the numbers and it's true in life and it's definitely true in business. And so I knew that if I could get our partners to hang in there with us for 10 years, they would start to see the compounding of relationships with each other. They'd see compounding of relationships with clients. They'd see compounding of the, of the network effect of just doing good business together. And they would definitely see a financial compounding. That was just straight, you know, my great love of, of, of what I call spreadsheet art, which is is the fiddling in spreadsheets until you can really communicate um, what the numbers mean. So that the 5149, a 10-year commitment, and then the third part, Clay, is a central management team. The firms pay 6.5% of their revenue for a central management fee and two and a half team and 2.5% for IP. Now, the reason that we did that was that the form of most accounting firms is partnership. And the problem with partnership is that they must distribute all of their income every year. So there's no ability to retain profits. That leads to, firstly, overdrawing. So they leave the corporate form very weak. And secondly, um, just no long-term investment to build some muscle in the organization. And so by having this 9%, it means that our flywheel, Jim Collins talks about the top of the flywheel's mission and the bottom's fuel. We have this 9% reinvestment. Now, for any of your listeners who are genuine investors, If you are internally reinvesting 9% of your revenues, as our group grows, our ability to reinvest under these firms grows and it's growing at an exponential rate against firms that don't invest a cent because the partners just overdraw and rip money out of these businesses and leave the actual form of the business very fragile. So I'd just like your listeners to understand that if there's a 10 million revenue firm in their local area and there's a 10 million revenue firm in their local area, If we invest into one of those firms, we're putting a services stream of income now that is over 10 million a year under that firm, which means that I'm sitting here with software engineers and graphic designers and and, and digital marketing experts and full-time dedicated recruiting function or learning and development and HR and finance and IT, et cetera, a resource of 35, 36 people under a local firm. It's an unmatched advantage. And so what it means is if we go head to head with that firm, that market, our firm is going to be massively advantaged. It's self-funding, it's self-sustaining, it grows as we grow. It's unbelievably capital efficient. Uh, We're not having to raise equity to do anything. We're not, none of this PE, we've got to sell a bunch of the firm to raise some money to reinvest in the firm. It's like, why don't we just drive earnings and drive reinvestment in a disciplined way to build that flywheel over time? And that's what's happening. So look, there's a bit to that, but basically those three elements of a 5149, a 10-year commitment, we've got 95 equity partners who've made that commitment, and 9% of the revenue being consistently reinvested in that structure, um, I think is, well, it is entirely unique 
in the entire world. And it is, um, extraordinarily powerful over time. Now there's plenty of different types of accounting firms. How about you talk about what your ideal partnership looks like and what you're looking for in a partner? How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. Yeah, so the ideal partnership is led by people that share our values. Our values are very simple. There's three core cool things we're looking for. Number one, that has to be a person for others a person that looks to make other people better off first before they think about their own self-interest. The second thing we're looking for is a person that keeps their promises. That means that on, on pain of death, they would turn up because they said they would. If they say they're going to do something, they'd rather die than not do that thing. And the third thing is a person that's firmly convinced that a team can do more than an individual. And so if we find those three things in the leadership of a firm, then we know we're onto a good thing. We're trying to find founder-led firms. These are typically typically men and women who've spent 30 plus years building a firm with their blood, sweat, and tears, pouring their soul into what we call their baby, the baby they've spent more time with typically than their actual babies, and that really reflects their commitment to their people, clients, and community. And when we find those firms, they're typically two to 10 million. They, they look after privately held, closely held family businesses is their, you know, 80% of their revenue. And they're concerned about what happens next. They, they are doing who they are as their profession. It's not a job. It's not, they're not there for the money. They'll continue to do it forever if you give them a structure where they can. But they're tired of being the person that's carrying this you know, entirely by themselves or with their, their small group of partners. And they're typically in a situation where their kids are now having grandkids and their wife is saying, hey, I want to spend more time with the grandkids. And the grandkids are out of state and up the road. And you know, the wife's like, well, come on, you know, I need a little bit of your time. Often, um, the, the gentleman or, or, or the woman is, is now got older parents who are, are needing more time and care and attention. And so they're like, Hey Brett, I love what I do, but I can't keep working like I'm 30 when I'm 65 or 70. I've got a great young partner group. They're confident they can run the clients, but, and, and the team, but they're not really confident they want to take on the whole firm. The dollars don't really work anyway. Um, what can we do? And we're finding a real resonance of our model um, anywhere we meet with people. I met with a firm in Scotland recently. I spoke to a firm in London. Um, we met with a firm in Utah, um, a number of firms in Texas. We've spoken to firms in Paris, etc. The model is based on structuring an organization so that the people can reach their full human and professional potential. And so we believe it's likely to resonate in, you know, in, in many places. We're in good company. There's a German group called ETL. They have 1,250 firms, $1.5 billion or 1.5 billion euro of revenue. They've been building a 50-50 model like ours for 50 years in Germany and are now growing through Europe. And so we're not alone in our approach, um, although our earnings are nearly three times um, theirs. I had mentioned that presentation our mastermind community member had done. And some questions came up from that uh, that I thought were quite interesting and a, a couple of which that I wanted to run by you. Let's start with the transition to the US. So Australia itself, you know, is a fairly large market in terms of uh, the number of potential partnerships you could reach there. And uh, some are asking, okay, why, why is Brett making the move to the US? Why is he uh, now in LA uh, making, I, I keep wanting to say making acquisitions, but uh, it's essentially uh, going and uh, entering these partnerships in California. We're building partnerships, Clay. 
Yep, that, that's right. So uh, talk about, uh, in your view, why you made the move to uh, California and turned your attention to uh, that market. So in a founder-led business, and for your listeners who haven't read The Founder's Mentality, which is a fantastic book that Bain and Company have published, they will never understand someone like me. I started the firm in a small room. There were four people. I had 200,000 of billings. And I had a crazy idea to build the group that you can more clearly see today. But any listener or investor should understand that they can't see what I can see. Any level of humility would make it clear that somebody that has spent, I'm 49 years old, I've been in the industry since I was 18, and it would be unlikely that anyone could meet anyone in the world that has spent more time thinking about what I'm thinking about in our industry than I have spent. And so it is impossible for somebody to fully understand what I can see. But what I can see is that we're the number 21st largest group in Australia. And on a run rate basis, we're number 17. And on a three-year basis, we'll be number 11 or 10. And number nine is more than two times that revenue in Australia. And so if we get to 120 million, we're about number 10 in Australia of revenue. Number nine is about 240. And number six is about 480. So I look at Australia and say, we can continue to compound in Australia indefinitely um, at 20% for a long, long time. And I'm confident enough in our team and our model to indicate that um, I don't need to be here for that to happen. The number one criticism that I've had over time is, but look at Kelly partners and what happens if Kelly's not there? Well, I started 10 years ago having 16 weeks holidays a year to get myself out of Australia so that my team could could learn and grow. And then I realized that if I stay, you know, on top of the businesses here every day, um, I'm in Sydney at the moment, um, then I wouldn't give my best people the opportunity to step up and, and fully run their functions. And so again, a good friend of mine who's built an enormous global business said, Brett, just get out of Australia. Now my son, I have a son who's 18, a son who's 16, a son who's 12. I'm a member of YPO. I've been to Harvard many, many times with YPO. And as a young person, um, Tom grew up seeing me go to the US to study. All my business heroes are in the US and he had decided that he wanted to go to college in the US. And so my wife said to me, look, Brad, I'm not sending Tom to the US by himself. Beck had published a best-selling book with Fran Drescher, the nanny in 2022, um, called Ennies for the Nanny. That's my wife. And when we were in the US um, as part of that, the two book launches she, that she did in March in New York and in September in LA, she noticed that a lot of people like to talk to me and do things with me. And she said, Brett, why aren't you doing anything in the US? And I said, well, honey, I've got this wife. That'd be you who thinks I'm a little busy. And if I was doing business in the US, I'd be away from home more. And she's like, well, why don't you, we just move to the US? And you just do a few more of these things that people want you to do, because I get the sense that if you don't, you know, in 10 years time, you'll be a little bitter. I said, okay, well, if you're keen, we need to find a house, we need to find a school, and we need to have some indication from the universe that that was what we should do. Lawrence Cunningham, for your listeners who don't realize, is the deputy chairman of Constellation Software. He's on our board. Lawrence had sent me a, an email during the lockdown. He said, Brett, your, your business looks fantastic. It was, it was referred to me by a friend of mine, and I just wonder, are you just trying to build the Constellation software of the accounting industry? And I said, yeah. He was the first person in 20 years or 18 years that had made that observation who actually understood what I'm trying to do. And so I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Let's have a Zoom. And we got on Zoom. He became a board advisor or board observer for six months and then asked him to join our board. I said to Lawrence, look, how crazy is it that we could do this in the US? He said, it's not crazy at all. Meet Mark Miller, who was the first, uh, the leader of the first business that Mark Leonard had bought. I met Mark in Omaha. Um, I talked to Mark for over an hour about, you know, how he'd built, I think he's got 4,000, no, he's got like 15,000 people in 40 countries or something now as part of the operating group that he runs for Constellation. We chatted about what was required. So then I did a bunch of trips. We had to get a visa. We had to just see if it made sense. And 
all the sort of stars aligned to indicate that it was what we should do. There is nothing that, that we're doing in the U S that will preclude us growing in Australia at all. Um, we will continue to grow as we always have in Australia and prosecute the opportunity here. The U S market is 15 times the size of Australia. The UK market is six times the size. We've taken the addressable market and grown it by 30 times. Um, and we have a number of ideas that we're testing as to how to grow into those markets. Firstly, we're trying to do in LA what we did in Sydney, which is go close, basically put a ring around LA and build a network of firms. We've done two so far. I think we've got another two coming. If you bet against um, our ability to execute on that, you'll definitely lose. Um, I have complete confidence that we can build a group in LA that looks very much like what we have in Sydney. We've been approached by management teams from many markets saying, you know, how could I partner with Kelly Partners to build your model in our market? And it's likely that we will partner with management teams in other markets um, to build Kelly Partners groups in a very capital efficient way in those markets. Uh, and again, you know, like most things, it'll look crazy until it isn't. Um, but if you're looking at somebody like me and I'm doing what you think I should be doing, then I'm definitely doing the wrong thing because there is no way that you can know what I know about our industry, let alone our business. And so as an investor, it takes a little bit of humility to say, well, you know, I, I just look at Twitter and I listen to the clowns commenting on what Musk is doing with Twitter. And I say, you know, Michelangelo went into the Sistine Chapel for four years. He put up all of that scaffolding and he painted every day for years and years and years. And because he was laying on his back, often with a candle, he would come out every day, I imagine, covered in paint. And he'd walk through the town and the clowns would go, look at that idiot with that paint all over his face. What does he think he's doing? He's been in there for years. What the hell's he doing? When I started this business, I was digging a foundation. I was down, 10 stories down, digging the mud, and it was filthy, ugly, horrible, nasty, difficult work. And I dug the hole, we put in the steel, we poured the concrete, and it's only the true missionaries, the true believers that are prepared to join you in that task. And it was horrible. No one wanted to know me. No one was interested in what we were doing. It was like, what is that crazy guy doing over there? But as we built floor after floor after floor after floor, you know, when you get up high and it starts to look up like you've got a penthouse, there's a lot of people that want to be your friends and will say, hey, can I come and come to the party in your penthouse? Now, they don't even realize that that's not a penthouse because you're still building, but there it is. It becomes easier and easier to attract people to what you're doing. Similarly, when Michelangelo was painting his roof and he had all that painting, everyone thinks he's crazy. But when he took down that scaffolding, which must have taken weeks, and eventually they brought people in and said, what do you think of that? People are like, I could never have imagined that that's what you were doing. And so, you know, I look at Twitter, old mate buys Twitter, everyone's commenting on what he's doing. And I said to everyone that would listen, all my mates, I said, mate, Musk is a genius. I have no idea what he's doing, but he's probably not wasting his time. And even if he is, everyone will make mistakes. What's it to you? It's his own money is in there doing what he's doing. And so it takes a level of, you know, I try to engage with the world with a level of curiosity, a level of humility. I, I don't know much, so I can't really know what they're doing, but I'm interested. Um, and so that's what we're doing. You know, we, we'll continue to grow in Australia. You know, we bought a 1.5 million revenue firm and a 3 million revenue firm in LA. We bought into those. So that building partnerships there, 65 year old. 51.49, we bought in a younger 36-year-old who bought 10%, so we're proving that a young person's attracted to the model. Then we bought the other firm that's 3 million, was built by one guy from zero to, to 3 million in six years who, who decided that he could get to 15 million easier with Kelly Partners than he could by himself. And so I'm just building the business case that, you know, is it likely that people are going to want to partner with us in the same way they have in Australia, you know, in a way that risks none of our capital? that is incredibly capital efficient, where there's an exponential return to the very minimal, if any, risk that we're taking. And so all I would say to people is, you know, we're not fools. We work extremely hard. We're quite cluey about what we do, and we're uncertain that there's anyone in the world that knows more about what we're doing in the two to 10 million, you know, accounting firm market. And so, um, you know, 
patients will prove to be very rewarding to them. You know, I do own 48% of the group. Um, I, I treat, you know, the way I've behaved as an owner, I think is completely aligned to my shareholders. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not running an experiment with other people's money. The consequences of my actions, I feel on a 50, 50 basis, essentially. I was happy to see Lawrence Cunningham, uh, sit on the board of Kelly partners group. I believe the only two other boards I know of that he sits on are constellation software and Markel. So you're definitely in good, good company there. So, well, at the time he joined Clay, the only other board he sat on was Constellation. And when I was at the Berkshire meeting last year, Tom Gaynor asked me, he said, Brett, you know, we're going to appoint um, Lawrence to the Markel board. Is that okay? I said, Tom, you're meant to be the smart guy here. You're a bit slow. But um, look, I think we're in good company. And, you know, it would be worthwhile for people to wonder why would Lawrence sit on a board at the time he joined? The market cap of the company was less than 200 million Australian dollars. Markel's market cap was 18 billion US dollars and Constellations was 50 billion US dollars at the, you know, at the time. So, you know, ideas come before actions. Actions lead to habits and habits are your future. And so for me, getting, getting around the people with the right ideas that can help us lift our standards and lift our sense of what's possible is why we hang out with people like Lawrence and, and many other incredible people. You know, we have a, a big vision of what's possible in our, in our space. So Constellation Software, if I'm not mistaken, they incentivize their management team uh, based on return on invested capital. And I noticed in your annual report that it states part of your compensation is based on a percentage of revenue. And, uh, at some of the investors I've talked with, this has been a talking point or a concern for some. So maybe you could talk more about this incentive and uh, if there's potentially any uh, plans to change that or uh, implement a different structure in any way. So Clay, after fiddling around, you know, we have an independent REM committee and when we listed the company, I wanted to take $1 as my salary, but the investors said that that would misstate earnings. And so if you were ever, were ever to leave as a CEO, Brett, we would need to have something in there to pay somebody. And so they calculated my salary as 1% of $36 million, which was our revenue at the time, which is where $360,000 came from in 2017. For the next five years, I didn't increase my remuneration by a single dollar. And even at $360,000 Australian dollars, I could have been earning three times that being a chartered accountant, not running a business. So I'm a chartered accountant with a master's degree that is probably one of the best business developers in the world in my space. And so I could certainly get paid a million Australian dollars a year to walk into a chartered accounting firm and just be a chartered accountant. I could do that about one day a week. So no investor has ever had to um, overpay for my uh, contributions. In the next five years, I moved the market cap with my team from 45 million to say 200. And, um, and today the market cap's about 315. That's 51% of the group the, the, that we own as a whole co. The other 49 that's owned by the operating partners is probably worth something. So you could imagine that in that period of time, we've created north of 600 million of value. And the average remuneration I've earned in that period is about 250,000 a year, a year across 18 years. So at the end of five years, I said to the board, look, you know, that 1%, I didn't want to increase my revenue until I'd shown some decent results for everybody. Um, but now you should probably put me, you know, recalibrate me back at my 1%. They didn't back pay me for the five years that they didn't pay me my 1%. Remember it was the board that came up with that, um, that REM strategy. I've demonstrated over 18 years that we can deliver 30 plus ROE returns and 30 plus ROIC returns. There's been no indication that that's ever changed. And so you're investing with somebody that for nearly 20 years has got a 30% plus CAGR, 30% plus EBITDA margins, 30% plus ROE. Now I'm in the business of attracting, developing and retaining talent. So what an investor has to say is, what would it cost to hire Brett? 
Well, it would cost a lot more than Kelly Partners Group Holdings currently pays me or has ever paid me. If you remunerated me on a constellation basis or a transdome basis, I'd probably own 95% of the group today. The typical ROE required of these guys is not very much, certainly not the ROE that, that I've delivered over time with my team. And so every year you'd be throwing options at me and I'd be owning a gigantic amount of the company. All in all, it's quite a fair way for the company. Uh, it's a very good deal for the company. And, you know, I've never put my interests ahead of the company. And that, I think that's the point is that, you know, if people look at the company, I, I moved to the US, the company lent me $1.8 million so that I could move. I needed to sell some property here so I could buy a property there. They lent me that money. I've paid back three quarters of that now. I sold some shares recently to pay some of that money back. I sold it, you know, 30% less than the shares trade today. I've just never put my interests in front of the interests of the company. And currently your company's listed on the Australian market. Is there a, a push or a desire to eventually get listed in the US and why or why not? Absolutely. So REQ Capital are a great investor in Sweden. I met them recently face-to-face, -face, which was great. But a number of years ago, they specialize in serial acquirers and we met them and they said, Brett, we know that you won't sell us an institutionally sized position in Kelly Partners because you're not prepared to lose control. I said, this is true. They said, why don't you just get a dual class structure? I said, you can't do that in Australia. And they said, why don't you just move exchanges? And so for many years now, since that conversation, I was like, well, I wonder if Australia will ever let you do it. No. So I really faced two choices. I can either raise capital, dilute myself, lose control of the group, or I can get a dual cloud structure somewhere. Ultimately, I think the place to build a global business, our aspiration is to build Australia's global accounting firm for driven private business owners. The best place to do that is from, you know, a US listing in US capital markets. And so when we can get an appropriate um, valuation on the group such that if, if we need to spend 12 to $15 million to do that, we can raise that capital at an appropriate valuation that's not massively destructive to our existing shareholders, um, then, then we'll definitely do that. Um, we've done all of the legal work to understand how to do it. It's not a difficult process. So it's our aspiration to list in the US at, at, at an appropriate time get a dual class structure. I'll do a sell down. Um, I own 48% of the group at the moment. I'll sell down to about 32 and a half to 35. I published that in our owner's manual when we first listed. It's been known by all, all of our investors forever. My aspiration is to be structured like Warren Buffett. Buffett has about a billion dollars outside Berkshire. He never put any of his money into Berkshire. He funds himself outside Berkshire largely. And then, and then he's got Berkshire, um, which has given him a, a very independent way of, of operating that business, which I think makes a huge amount of sense. And so that's always been my goal is to get a dual class structure so I can continue to have control of the group, um, do a sell down. So I'm independently funded and then sit there, you know, I'm 50 in August. I have a 25 plus a 25 year plan to, to continue to grow the group. Um, it's a long compounding, you know, mindset. And I think we've got a demonstrated, um, track record of behavior that that lines up with that mindset um, that people can can get very comfortable with. So at that point, um, you know, Australian shareholders or anyone that's a shareholder in the Australian stock would get listed US shares. And, um, and you know, we, we would love to be able to put our financial metrics next to CBIZ. CBIZ is the only listed accounting group in America and our EBITDA margin is nearly three times theirs. Our ROIC is more than two times theirs. Our ROE is nearly three times theirs. And I think that our model is stronger than their model. Um, now, being listed in Australia increased the number of, uh, the amount of deal flow to us by 10 times pre-IPO, post-IPO, because it gave us real credibility and visibility in the market. We already have that credibility and visibility in this market. We believe if we were listed in the US, that would give us credibility in the US market and visibility, and it is likely to translate into the UK and other places because it's really the preeminent place to play. So that's the theory behind it. Um, we think that if we can be, you know, the strongest alternative to private equity in the US market outside CBS that is really focused on buying much larger firms, 
then that proposition would be extraordinarily successful in that market. Um, CBIS is, you know, two and a half, three billion market cap, a billion of revenue, more than 50% insurance, I think too. So, you know, if we need to be three times our size to, to have a market cap in excess of theirs because of the margin difference, and I think it's achievable. I also wanted to ask you about your uh, 2023 results. It looks like the uh, net income and earnings per share uh, came back a little bit. And I believe that was the year you also moved to the United States. So for investors that are curious for why the potential slowdown, I know uh, you think on five-year time periods and you know you want to attract investors that think long-term and give the company room to run. Yeah. What, what was going on in 2023 that led to that pullback? Cause presumably you would, uh, have had, you know, more partnerships that are, you know, growing the overall business. Um, yeah. So maybe you could speak to that. Yeah. So for, for anyone that looks, you know, I say to people, you know, the great Jim Rohn quote, you know, be a meaningful specific, not a wandering generality, you know, be a deep person in a superficial world. Any review of the materials that we publish that are incredibly clear and massively comprehensive would make very clear to any investor that we made the strategic decision that we clearly communicated that we would invest beyond our 9% to build our US platform in that year. It cost two and a half million Australian dollars as we shared it, we expected it would. And so that on a non-recurring basis, it would take some money to build a platform for growth in the US market. And so that's what we did. Um, if you take that number out of our numbers, you'll see that our growth continues. It is best for people to look at free cash flow and free cash flow per share. We've shrunk the number of shares on issue since IPO. We have 45 million shares exactly on issue, and our free cash flow continues to grow very strongly every year. And so you can look into the numbers and get yourself confused. However, um, I think Ken, our CFO, does a very good job of, of providing, you know, clear, clear information. We expect that we did 5.4 million NPAT last year. We'll do eight and a half million plus this year. And, you know, the growth from revenue to earnings is obvious. If you back out the additional investment that we've made, which is sort of easy to, to see. Now, we've now got a seven-year track record of a listed company of basically doing this additional investment beyond our 9% and then squeezing it back as we grow, and then we'll, then we'll ramp it up a bit, and we'll squeeze it back as we grow. We have to invest ahead of growth. You know, if we know that we're going to have a firm join us, we have to have the hands there to catch that and integrate and do that very well. We're not prepared to have a group join us and then do a poor job of integration we do a world-class job of integration so that that firm will be part of our group forever. And that, that requires us investing, you know, ahead of the curve. Wonderful. Well, uh, I really appreciate you joining me, Brett. It's been uh, fun getting to know you a little bit better and learn a bit more about Kelly partners as well. For those that would like to learn more about Kelly partners or, uh, learn more about you, uh, I, I just want to give you a chance to share any uh, resources uh, you'd like to point the audience to? You know, I love the saying, Clay, seek and you will find. That's a commandment, but it's also a promise. What it means is that I can't do your seeking. In order for you to find, you have to do your seeking. So you have to read the owner's manual. You need to go from 2017, print out everything we've ever published and sit there with a pen and a ruler in a quiet place and do the work. But if you do the work, what you'll discover is that my team and I have been doing the work and will continue the work, to do the work with great passion to prosecute what we think is a reasonable um, business proposition, an understandable business model that is duplicatable in many places. Now, we're prepared to do this for a long time because we love it. We are driven by a mission to make other people better off. We believe we have values that are not just eternal, but certainly um, workable in all places, times, and cultures. And the vision that we have for the business is not crazy. We're not trying to take a rocket to the moon and then get that rocket to come back down and land. We're trying to build a global accounting firm of which there are many, but we're trying to build one with an Australian flavor, with a self-starting, challenge the status quo, get up and go that Australians are very well known for. 
you can wander around America and see the Westfield Group. And for your listeners that don't realize, that's an Australian group built from Sydney, the world's largest shopping center group. It's all over America. I'm following the playbook that the Lowy family established in 1985. And if you haven't read the book on Frank Lowy and you've never heard of him because you're American and you haven't looked outside America, get the book and read it and you'll be much better off for it. He's one of the world's greatest ever entrepreneurs. There are many Australians who are the leaders in industries all around the world, and um, and we aim to to sort of join that group. A really tremendous mentor of mine that I did catch up with yesterday he said a great thing to me. He said, Brett, it's so great you've moved to LA. He said, I was in Australia, one of the wealthiest men in Australia. And he said, I for three years, I pushed my group to grow globally. But then I realized that you can't lead by pushing from behind. You have to get out in front. And so he picked up his wife, his two kids, moved to Singapore and conquered the Asian market, moved to the Bahamas, conquered the US market, and is now in, in Monaco and Europe. I thought that was such a, like a great observation in that, you know, business is show business. It's not tell business. For me to communicate clearly to our team that I believe it's possible for us to take our ethos and our model through the world and to the world and win in these markets, researching Australian businesses have grown globally. It was clear to me that if this CEO didn't lead by moving, it couldn't and wouldn't happen. And so that's, you know, that's what we're on about. Um, Rupert Murdoch's a divisive and not necessarily popular figure everywhere he goes, but he did build the world's largest media empire. He is Australian and he did that by moving first from Adelaide to Melbourne and then from Melbourne to London and then from London to the US. He's a useful case study in that respect. And so we're just following, you know, trying to walk in the steps of giants, stand on the shoulder of giants, learn from people who are much smarter and wiser and deeper and broader than I am. And, you know, with a lot of effort, a bunch of elbow grease, we think that it's possible that we can, um, you know, do okay over time. Now, I'm known to under-promise and over-deliver. I've promised our shareholders that I think we can grow 5% organic and 5% acquisition essentially forever. It is unlikely that ta the tax system is going to disappear. And don't kid yourself that AI is going to put us out of business because tax law is not code. It is made by words and then it is fought about in courts for decades, and it is never settled. And so it is unable in complex private groups that we look after to be eradicated with AI. It's a very superficial observation, although AI and all technology has always helped our organizations. The Australian Tax Act has grown at 13% by number of pages per annum for 50 years. And the U.S. Tax Act would be similar. The proportion of lawyers in Congress, the proportion of law lawyers in parliaments around the world is higher today than it ever has been. And lawyers love to make laws and they never get rid of the ones that they made yesterday. And so we think that we're on a big macro mega trend. We're in a market that we expect to continue for as long as human life itself continues, death and taxes. And we think we are excellent at our tiny circle of competence, which is operating accounting firms for private business owners in the two to ten million dollar range. I think we're as well read as anyone committed to being lifelong learners, and we're radically committed to execution. And so if we keep at it, we'll probably do okay. And um we're honest and transparent, which is, you know, a lot more than you can hope for with many people I've stumbled across over the years. So I love to get good feedback. I'd encourage people to do the work. You're not going to find a hundred bagger because it came and sat in your lap. You're going to have to do some work. As a company, we've tried to make that as easy as we can for you. And um, I'd be more than happy at any time, Clay, to do a Q&A and, and to get some questions. What we typically do with investors is we get them to email us. We get a list of questions, we answer them with all things we've already published, and we hope to find one or two pearls of wisdom that we have never thought of. And essentially our investors, we've treated as partners and regard them as partners who continue to use their incredible brain power 
to improve our business. And it's a very efficient model because we don't have to pay them anything for their excellent consulting. So, <laughs> so that's the mindset. I really appreciate you spending the time with me today and I hope it, um, it helps people better understand what we're on about. Well, great. Thanks so much, Brad. Uh, you know, I, I really look forward to watching the journey continue to unfold and, uh, uh, watch how it all plays out. And, uh, you know, it, it's going to be fun to, uh, you know, you're 49 today and you mentioned the 25 year journey and it reminds me, I just interviewed, uh, Andrew Brenton a few months ago, and he just crossed his, uh, 25 year mark in being an investment manager. And he, he, he just said the same thing. I'm looking forward to the next 25 years. So it's wonderful to get to be able to speak with, uh, amazing people and follow their journey as well. I appreciate it. Claire. I really do. Thank you. There has been a lot of investors from all over the world, actually, that have been interested in knowing more about Technion and investing in Technion, but we have very little free float. There is very little stock that is trading every day, which I'm happy about because I think it means that we have shareholders that are interested in being part of this long-term rather than speculating and trading over our reports.